perspective on cosmology. And this is based on two papers, recent papers, one with Obeid, Oguri, and Spolineko, and the other one with Agrawal, Obeid, and Steinhardt. So, um, so perhaps I should say what's my main aim in this talk. My main aim in this talk, is, uh, which is part of this uh, ideas related to Swampland, is to discuss aspects of cosmology in this setup. And uh, the main aim is that in cosmology, perhaps we have not been very, uh, we have not brought stringy ingredients too much to bear on it. And uh, I will try to motivate that not bringing stringy aspects has made cosmology difficult to fit within string theory, the usual paradigms of cosmology. And so these aspects, uh, by no means is to turn off some directions that people have done in string theory. It's great that people have studied all these different aspects and they should continue studying the conventional ways of fitting cosmology in string theory. But there are new directions that might be interesting and I'll try to motivate you, regardless of the conjectures that I'm going to discuss, there are new directions in string theory that we should be exploring. And that's what my main point is going to be. Not to say something is wrong or this is wrong or that's wrong, but more precisely, there are new directions, and so I want to expand the possible sets of how we can connect string theory to experiments, which potentially can have more predictive power, actually, than the current way we are trying to do string theory connections with cosmology. So that's my main aim for this for the talk today. So, um, so what I will first do, I will first review for you some basic aspects of cosmology. So I will call cosmological facts. <laughs> And also, we'll talk about particle physics facts. So, um, so let's start with cosmology. Uh, early universe, very early universe. We, so let's talk about the past of cosmology. We start with, conventionally, we thought there was the Friedman, Robertson, Walker kind of setup, but uh, this gets into problems, and in particular, the homogeneity is one of the issues, for example. Uh, causal connection between different patches of the uh, CMB gives you some issues with this FRW picture. And that is one of the motivations, in particular, as you know, of inflation, where we have a period of uh, a cosmic acceleration at the beginning, enough to make the observable parts of the FRW uh, of uh, CMB that we are getting today in causal contact and causing homogeneity and this and that. So there are very nice features. And inflation does that with relative ease. So inflation, which is basically a very simple idea, at the outset of it, from the effective field theory viewpoint, looks a very simple idea. Uh, if, uh, it seems like it solves a nice problem, and why not? So that's the attitude that uh, inflation has, inflation people have, and I can see why. It's a very nice, simple idea, and it gives uh, macroscopic features, and the basic features of homogeneity features comes out right, including also fluctuations which are imprinted in the context of inflation by quantum fluctuations, which when they, uh, when they get frozen into the fabric of the space-time, then it, it becomes gives rise to the galaxies, etc., and they fit with all these uh, uh, various pieces that we have seen in the, uh, in the data. And so there's a lot of evidence for this simple idea. I should say that the amount of check that has gone to it is not as much as you might think. That is, basically homogeneity has been checked together with slight fluctuations. Those are the basic aspects that have been checked. So even though you see this power spectrum of this angular thing and it looks like a peaks, all this matching and all that, the amount of data that goes to it as far as inflation is not as much as you might think. So it's not like every little peak is a new story of inflation. So it's not like that. But still, I will still give credit to the fact that the idea is very simple and it seems like to give to fit in a nice framework. Can I ask a, a general yes. Uh, are we going to be able to use string theory to decide which approach to cosmology is the Well, I will, I will go, I will, I mean, decide is a strong statement here, but <laughs> I'll just guide you through what people are doing and what my view is, and you know, we, people, these are the people, we, we can decide what we want to do, so. So, um, so one aspect of inflation that even at the beginning looked a little bit strange was, uh, was the fact that in order to get the potential things that to work, you needed to have a relatively flat potential like this. 
in terms of the inflaton field, where the field rolls, and uh, it stabilizes here, and it radiates, and it stabilizes here nicely to something of the order of 10 to, now we know, of the order of 10 to the minus 122 in fundamental units, and maybe this starts something of order of m gut to the fourth, or, or, or one, or something. So it starts with some huge thing, and then suddenly rolls down. So well, that already is a funny, funny feature that uh, people, you know, cosmological constant problem, is nobody has solved this really satisfactorily, people blame it on anthropics and this and that, but that's one issue. The other one is the relatively long range that you have to move in the field space in order to get there, and people s say, well, okay, why not? We can have such potential, and Srebinski, for example, originally when he was talking about these kind of models, wrote potentials which are very similar to what people still consider today as potentially interesting for cosmology. So. So there are examples like this, and people, people have already discussed these. Now, already, this raises flags in the context of discussions we have had in the workshop. Then you delta phi in Planck units turns out to be bigger than necessarily bigger than 1 to get a long enough period of inflation to give you the 60E folding that's necessary uh, in, in the inflation in order to explain the homogeneity that we see in CMB. So that's already a little bizarre. Now. Does it prove it's not possible? Well, not necessarily. Gary talked about possible models. For example, maybe uh, the uh, axial monodromy models or this and that, which potentially can make this maybe 5 or 10 in fundamental units. So could. Whether it does, it's questionable yet. It's not clear whether it's, they have, there is such construction. There are, I think, people naturally you're going to the you're pushing the string theory to its extremes and so their calculational power is limited and so we have issues whether or not we really have established existence of these things but i would not say we have ruled out such a possibility so there's possible that you know you could say that just to give a just to give a positive spin on this one you say look phenomenology that we live in is very fine tuned so maybe this is also fine tuned and maybe it's possible to get these yes there are also models that are not by small right? yeah well, people, th this is the typical models for the inflation, and then there are other models which have other problems. So we can talk about all possible issues of models, but the models that people now favor, again, it's not universal. Most, most people in believe in inflation, believe in these what's called the plateau models. That seems to be the most popular one. By no means the only models. People can add various uh, things to it. So uh, anyhow, so this is certainly uh, you know, possible. You could say phenomenology is fine-tuned. Hierarchy is an example. So maybe this is also fine-tuned, just like cosmology constant. So who's to say? Okay, we cannot say just because it looks fine-tuned is bad. We have learned that lesson. In fact, the lesson from Swampland is that some things are naturally fine, sometimes fine-tuned, and that's sometimes there are good gravity reasons that we learn later. So effective field theory is not a good guide to decide what is fine-tuned. That's what we are learning in the context of the Swampland. Some of the intuition about the fact the field theory is what is fine tuned or not may not be correct in the context of a quantum theory of gravity. That's possible. So maybe there are models like this which are not, which, which could happen in some form. But uh, again, in the context of string theory, which has quantum gravity, it's hard to get them at least, if not impossible. So this is a potential issue that uh, has to be dealt with. OK. Um, so that's a brief description of, of where the so this is a current paradigm of, uh, of current universe. That, that's how we believe could potentially explain what we have in the universe observed today. And that would be the very early universe. And this could be the string realization, potentially, in the context of the axion models for other, other kind of string models. But it's, it's, it's interesting that nobody claims to have gotten delta phi, let's say, 20 or 30 or 40. So we are at the borderline of possible uh, possibilities within string theory, even the constructions that people are claiming. So it's not like parametrically we can like make this large in string theory. It is difficult, and we, don't, we know that's not easy or impossible. Whether or not you can make it 1, 5, or 10, at best, it's fine-tuned, at best. So that's the point. So, so we could say potentially we can put this in string theory in something which, even in the quantum gravity context, namely in the garden variety string context, looks fine-tuned. But still, it doesn't rule it out. It's possible, but it looks fine-tuned. OK, um, so that's the past cosmology. The recent cosmology, well, uh, since it was discovered uh, in the late 90s that we have dark energy, uh, despite the uh, string theorist effort to prove it, and we, we failed. So that was good that we failed. And people found there was a dark energy. 
Um, and people try to find models, and naturally, string theorists had to find models which fit the observed data, the dark energy. And the most natural thing was to find a model like this. Like you have a, a f scalar field would have energy 10 to the minus 122 or so in, in fundamental units, in Planck units. So how do you get these? Well, you have to scan a, of the order of 10, at least this many inverse of that many vacuo, roughly speaking, if you s have a random like distribution between 0 and 1. So you could say that since we have so many choices, why not? We can get such thing. Just an anthropic principle could explain why we are in one of these. So that was the, that was the context that uh, motivated string theorists, for example, KKLT and uh, uh, supercritical strings, supercritical dimensions, and so on, and other efforts to try to explain or come up with models of, uh, of uh, current universe, the present. But um, people attempting to actually realize this in string theory are, so there are some claims that there are attempts that have realized this, some people claim, and there are some, uh, some issues that raise, as we heard yesterday, the issue of, in particular, the anti-D3 brain introduction and the back reaction and the issues surrounding that are subject to debate still, and so people have different views on it. Now, one thing that in these, the original KKLT paper was mentioned, and this is actually something which is, uh, I want to uh, say that that's an issue that was not necessarily clear, is that the issue was that, uh, can you find something which solves their problem? And in some point, they needed to uh, solve a hard problem. And they say, well, there's so many choices that one of them would do the job. So in other words, the, the, once you fee, face a hard, hard issue, like, like this small number or something like that, you could say, OK, since we have a huge number, why not? Okay? Now, the why not from the effective field theory sounds reasonable, right? If you take a random function, why not? Indeed, why not? You can have, if you have this many vacuum, why not one of them like that? That's, that's fine. But why not might have a non-effective field theory description which is the swampland kind of problem, which may say why not, but we don't know exactly how to describe an effective field theory language. So this why not issue, so this idea that people use again and again, which I believe is a little bit dangerous, and in fact, it is dangerous in the context of quantum gravity, is to say effective field theory is fine, and genericity argument. Genericity argument with an effective field theory mindset is incorrect. What, is we th what, what we think as a generics thing in an effective field theory sense is not necessarily what a string theory involving quantum, a, a consistent quantum gravity may prefer. So our intuition is not guided correctly when we just look at effective field theory. So, um, so that argument is not, is not necessarily reliable to say we have so many choices, therefore one of them would work. That's not, that's not a good enough argument. So many people working on this subject basically point to the fact that the number of possible constructions is bigger than this, therefore there must be one like this or something like that. So this kind of a lot of them goes like this counting argument rather than actually constructing it. And there are, but, but there are some people who have claimed they have constructions, and then the issue in those cases would be, and uh, I mean, it's, I, I sympathize because the comp computational control is very difficult in these kind of contexts. You want to have string coupling small, the curvature is large, and this and that, and we will see that there are various no-go theorems on this. You have to violate something which is, uh, which is uh, not easy to realize in, in these contexts, and that is, that is the main problem with this. So again, KKLT may or may not work, at least uh, may work, but also may not work. We don't know. May or may not. It's still under debate. So uh, again, I don't want to say if it's, I have no, I don't want to say anything strongly against or for it, because it could, could or not. I don't know. Um, so we'll leave it like that for now. So as you can see this, uh, as Dave's question, whether or not we will know, there are attempts. but. All of the attempts, precisely when we are trying to match our universe, looks a little uh, questionable, whether we have managed to do it or whether it's highly fine-tuned, one or the other. Everybody agrees that this number is highly fine-tuned in string theory. That is no doubt. So, so we have to deal with that somehow. And so either, either uh, if you take a KKLT viewpoint, then you will have to deal with that too. Future. Well. What is the future status? Um, well, to get a gain insight about the future, there's a puzzle, which is, uh, in, I will reformulate it, not the usual way it's formulated, but in, a, in some sense equivalent to it, is that if you take the age of the universe today, 
is of the order of the scale set by the cosmological constant in the, in the fundamental units I'm doing again. So, was first observed, I guess, by Dirac. Uh, no, I guess Dirac, would, Dirac said in the context of maybe matter density and so on, perhaps. Here I'm using the dark energy itself. So, but yes, in some form, that's why I'm saying it's in different form. So, yeah, in some form it's like related to matter density and so forth, but in this context I'm talking about just a dark energy. That's right. This is what's called a coincident prime. Why do we live in such an age which is set exactly by the natural time scale that you get from the dark energy? Why is that? It's a little bizarre. So, uh, just so you know, this, this is the usual thing. You know, you get a dot over a squared is of order lambda. So the natural time scale is 1 over square root of it. So this is the natural relation between the dark energy and the time scale set by it. I'm setting m, Planck, and all that to 1. So this is, this is a, a funny feature. So roughly speaking, the age of the universe today is roughly 10 to the 61 or so in, in Planck units. OK. Why is this? This is called coincidence. We happen to live in such a time. Uh, this will sound very strange in this context, because if you have a context like this, uh, if you ask what is a typical lifetime of a universe sitting in the sitter space, it could be arbitrarily long, because there's no, no telling what is the height of this potential. And uh, people even have debated whether you can make tunneling in the de Sitter, like Tom Banks and so on, debate whether that's even possible. But at any rate, regardless of that issue, it's, there's no reason it has to be, if there's a metal stable, there's no obvious reason why it has to be short-lived. Typically, it would, I would say, a, a random one would be very long-lived, depending on this height. And so there's no relation between this height, the dark energy, and this height or the time, the time we have to live. In other words, then this would be truly a coincidence problem. We happen to live exactly at this time, but we could have lived trillions and trillions, 10 to the power of trillion years later, and still would have been OK in some sense. Okay, that would have been a possibility. So this would be strange. This would have no answer in the context of this kind of picture. So if you take the Desitter viewpoint, this remains, continues to remain a puzzle. OK, so this is uh, facts I wanted to basically review for the cosmology. Sorry. But doesn't this simply tell us that, the, that, that lambda started dominating, dominating uh, not so long ago? This is related to that fact. This is related to the fact. So in that sense, you could say the fact that now the lambda is dominating is related to the fact. So we have just come into when lambda begins to dominate. Right. Why not much later? Why did we come in much later when it was always expanding? What was the problem with that? Because if I assume a matter-dominated universe, then I get that the age of the universe is of some number of order one times. Uh, well, as, as uh, Martin said, that's, that was another version of right. stating the coincidence. Since they are almost, since it's only in the recent epoch we have Going to an accelerating phase, they will give you the same kind of numbers. It's not, it, that wouldn't change the, the, the kind of uh, statement. OK, um, good. You somehow put in here some kind of, or well, I mean, to some extent it relies on how sentient beings are. are do I do? I mean, I, I, it, it's somewhat weird. I mean, to some degree, we know that it takes a while for stars and galaxies to form. Yes, and you have form. Why did we come now? Well, because we could have, we could, time more or less when they formed the first one. Why do we just happen just at the very birth? We could have come 10 to the 10 to the 10 later. What's the problem? I don't think so, right? Wouldn't then, I mean, how long are stars formed? In the, in the universe with a cosmological constant, I'm not sure that that is possible. I mean, it can be maybe 10 times later. You could, you could blame this on the properties that the galaxy, the stars may have disappeared or something yeah. like that. You could, you could get, play that game, but it's, it's not, it's still, we'd be much longer. We have much longer yeah, to go to get 10 or 100. I don't think it's 100 or, or you could try to explain it by other means, like uh, uh, other aspects of the matter structure. But uh, from the viewpoint of the dark energy, it's still puzzle. So that's, there, there's a coincidence there which is still puzzling. So, um, you may just make a comment. There's some papers by Raphael and collaborators you know, in the context of the measure problem. Like if you have a choice, say, say use the causal patch measure, they 
they discuss how you th they think that that, that that should be natural in that context. Okay, they try to explain this. Okay, I'm not aware of that, but okay, that would be interesting to study. In the context of the dissiter, certainly, uh, I mean, I do not know how you can, uh, I mean, in the context of string theory, I do not know how you can say this height is related to this height. Yeah, I mean, it, you, you, use a you add a mesh, you have to make an assumption of a mesh. Yeah, the measure of the string vacuum to me is very suspicious, to be honest. I mean, yeah, it's difficult to believe it. What do you mean by the measure of the string vacuum? Well, that's, that's another <laughs> conversation, I guess. Well, it's the same conversation because you're saying they make a measure. So I, I'm just saying that we cannot rely on such statements. So uh, it is certainly there is a coincidence problem, and depends on how you want to view it, there's an issue there. So that's, I just leave it like that. OK, I will go to the particle physics facts. So uh, we know that we have a standard model, the visible matter sector, maybe, maybe in, in embedded inside, presumably inside some kind of grand unification scheme, and dark matter. These are experimentally known. We know we have dark matter. We know we have standard uh, matter, standard model matter. And we know that the energy, roughly speaking, 5% of the energy universe is in the standard matter. and maybe 25% or so in the dark matter, and so on. What is the picture? How do we think about this picture in string theory context? Well, um, there's a natural setup in which you can imagine how this arises in string theory. Notice that the standard matter content is asymptotically free. Right? We could have had a huge number of generations. We only have three, and so on. And so the fact that you're getting something which is actually explainable by field theory alone. It's striking for grand unified theory. In other words, even if you take m Planck to infinity, you would get the gut. In other words, the gut has, does not rely on gravitational effect to make sense. You don't need, if it was not asymptotically free, you would need some gravitational aspects to complete it. So this theory is a standalone object, which means this guy could potentially have made sense even if you sent m Planck to infinity. Even if you sent it to infinity. Which suggests that if M Planck going to infinity in string context means the volume gets bigger and bigger of the internal manifold, means that this is coming from a local region of the compactification geometry. So it's a very natural model to believe that the standard model comes from the, you have some manifold, and somewhere there's some local region which survives even after you, after you take the manifold to be bigger and bigger. Yes? We don't really know that right, for the Higgs sector, the scalar couplings in the cover couplings. The Higgs sector is, is uh, you mean in terms of whether it's uh, asymptotically free or not? Yes, that's true. So there's, I'm talking about the matter sector more, more precisely. So the Higgs sector, right. So the Higgs sector, for example, could be somewhat connected to our universe, but could be somehow a little bit needing the gravity effect. In fact, I will come to that in some context. So that might be, that's, not an, that's relevant to my talk, uh, discussion at the end of my talk. But for now, let me just say that the standard model, like the number of generations and the gauge group and all that, looks nicely fits within the context of um, local region in the space of the compactification. Now, in any compactification we are aware of, or in garden variety compactification we are aware of in the context of string theory, uh, oh, sorry, another way of saying is that you can imagine having a D brain like wrapped around some particular region here and so forth. And these regions are positively curved geometries that can contract, so differently can survive even after you make the rest of the manifold big. That means M Planck going to infinity does not destroy their existence, and that's fine. But there are other fields. In string theory, it's very difficult just to get this one thing, and you get many other stuff. So, and I think it's morally that there should be a theorem to the effect, even though I do not know how to precisely formulate it, the matter sector of any quantum gravity is morally not asymptotically free. Morally, not, in other words, if you include everything, you have to get extra junk. It's not just pure field theory. It has to have something else. In other words, gravity should be good for something. Gravity is curing something. What? Well, the matter stuff is, is not working, so gravity is OK. It's my task to fix things. So gravity is needed for them to fix. And it's, I, I, I don't know how to precisely form this conjecture, but I would not be surprised if there's a swampland criteria, which all the effective field theories that we get uh, in the concept of quantum gravity are not asymptotically free. And this would morally imply that in addition to our sector, which is asymptotically free, there must be other stuff. 
this other stuff that could, should come somehow from other modes in the Calabia or, or other compactification would be the reason that we have dark matter, in a sense. So it's a nice kind of picture that why do we have dark matter and why how we could get a standard model could fit. And maybe the fact that it's five times bigger is not that unreasonable given that you, know, you take a region in space and the rest of them, maybe there are more structures allowed and so. So it's not at all exotic that we are a minority. We are a minority because we are, <laughs> we are a tiny piece of the space somehow. We are not probing the whole aspects of the compactification geometry. So it fits. It gives a relatively nice, nice uh, picture, I would say. And the F-theory model building concentrates on these kind of possibilities where the local feature of the geometry gives you the matter structure that we are made of. OK. Um, but dark matter is, is at best very weakly coupled to our sector. It hasn't been detected other than this gravitational effect so far. So at best, it's very weakly coupled to our sector. We do not know what is the uh, exact coupling because we haven't discovered it. Gravity certainly mediates between them and us, but we don't know what it is. But it should be weak. That, for sure, we know. At best, it's very weak. So, so the dark matter sector should somehow be either localized in pieces that are far from us or somehow scattered enough so that it doesn't interact with the wave functions that we are made of localized in this space. So it's kind of orthogonal or, or at least very little overlap. So that must be. Otherwise, we have a problem. So the dark matter is so weakly coupled. So there's very weak interaction between them. If, if, if more than gravity still, it should be very weak. <clears throat> OK. Now, there are, there are other aspects of this piece that looks nice. Namely, if you think about the local geometry, we have learned in string theory that's easy, or at least it's not that difficult, to freeze moduli locally. That is. You can easily consider local pieces where a sphere of size gets frozen. Sphere gets frozen by fluxes locally very easily. We have very workable models. For example, we understand confinement of n equals to 1 supersymmetric QCD that way, based on string models which are local. And so we understand how locally you can freeze a geometry like a sphere or some matter. And typically, the coupling constants of the theory get related to the volume of the internal geometry. So for example, the fine structure constant will be related to the volume of maybe of some, some, uh, some geometry like that, the standard model of, the, uh, of the, the piece that the standard model comes from. And it's frozen, so that could be no problem. And you can have a geometry like that. And then therefore, uh, it's not surprising to say that these do not vary in time because they're frozen. In fact, there are bounds like the fine structure constant varies very little. Uh, so if, if you go from the z equals to 1 to present, from the redshift value from z equals to 1 to z equals to 0, we know there are strong bounds of the form delta alpha over alpha is less than 10 to the minus 6. So it kind of is a frozen piece of the rest of the geometry. For sure it's not. Now, we cannot be completely sure if the rest of the geometry is frozen or not. We cannot be sure. But we are sure about the dark matter sector, the standard model sector looks very frozen. If, if it's moving, it's moving very little. And that's not exotic. We can arrange easily like this. But we do not have as clear a picture about how the rest could or could not vary. Of course, if the rest, if the rest of the geometry is changing in time in some way, it will affect the dark matter sector from what I said more, more strongly than our sector, potentially. So that would be interesting also a question for the dark matter sector. OK, I think that's all I wanted to say about particle physics and how it could potentially fit in string theory. Any questions? OK, so then um, so as I just so let's go back again to, uh, to cosmology, uh, to the inflation question in the context of cosmology. So, so we said the stringy construction of inflation runs into difficulty. And at best, one has to, difficulty does not mean insurmountable difficulty, but it's difficult. And it, at best, it has, one has to use un, uh, very uncontrolled regimes of calculations, perhaps, or very fine-tuned regions to get it, potentially using 
using the string ideas. And the sitter, again, as I said, is the kind of why not? If you have a huge number of vacuum, why don't you get it? However, now I will try to explain why, why there are difficulties in a simpler language. Consider M theory in 11 dimension and compactify it to 4 dimension using a 7 dimensional manifold. Now, this 7 dimensional manifold does not have to be Calabia or hyperbolic or positively curved or anything. Take an arbitrary 7 manifold and take an arbitrary flux turned on it, G flux. Arbitrary. Well, now I will qualify what I mean by arbitrary. Except make it non singular. In other words, make the curvature and the G much, much less than one in Planck unit. In, in other words, you don't want to have something which is Planckian. So take a smooth geometry with, uh, with uh, nice, some nice curvature and some, some, little, some flux which is not huge in Planck units. You can consider this class. Well, you would imagine uh, you can get, if you take arbitrary seven manifolds, look, seven manifolds, I'm not sure the classification of seven manifolds, but huge number, right? Do anything you want. Of course you're going to find some situation like this, right? You take a potential, and you know, some place, if you take, what is the potential of? The potential will be functions of all these moduli of all the possible metrics and the fluxes and the, all, all that stuff, okay? A reasonable physicist who believes in effective field and genericity would have said, come on, there's no reason you cannot find something like this, right? Okay, that's the first generic statement. If you don't know any better, you would certainly say, there's no reason why there wouldn't be a potential as a function of this moduli. At some point, there will be a critical point with positive value, maybe 10 to minus 120, maybe some other value, some value. Now, Maldacena and Nunes show a no-go theorem that is impossible. This is impossible. That is, if you have a weak regime, if you have a large enough manifold, so you, have, you don't have to appeal to Planckian effects, if you check the, the leading terms in the supergravity Lagrangian and try to find there would never be an effective critical point with positive value like this. That's impossible. It already shows, and the, the argument they do is extremely simple and nice. Nothing amazingly difficult. They show this impossible. This already shows that what we might think about the effective field theory is not necessarily right. Now, this does not rule out, of course, these possibilities because they're assuming Planckian effects are not important. You can have singularities in string theory, of course. Sometimes you get gauge theories from them. Sometimes you do this and that. So we are used to that. So, so the argument there is that, OK, fine. This kind of sitter you will not get from the nice, smooth, m theory compactification. Look for other stuff. OK, so that's the answer to there. But it also proves the thing that bothers physicists like me, that there is no harmonic oscillator for sitter space. <laughs> that is. There is, if, even if there is, you have to do something exotic, like quantum effect or something which is exotic, Planckian in M theory, to construct one. But ADS, no problem. Just sending the lambda from negative to positive has such a dramatic implication. There's absolutely no problem, as you know, in M theory to get ADS space. Very easy. Not just because of supersymmetry. Supersymmetry, of course, helps, but you, you, can, you cannot, you cannot their, their argument specifically says if V is positive, there's no critical point. If V is negative, you could have a huge number of manifolds and fluxes for which there's a, there's a critical point. It may not be even supersymmetric. Supersymmetry are easy examples of that, but there's no reason that that's not possible for, for non-supersymmetric ones as well. So there seems to be something fishy. That is, you either say, OK, we just look somewhere else. This is not a good class. Or you begin to ask if there is something swamplandish going on here. Is it possible that this is a beginning hint that there's a problem with the sitter? in the full quantum gravity. This is orientifold from the M theory would exactly look like this singularity. So orientifold does not, in the M theory, doesn't exist in that context. Of course, you can talk about, well, there's a hojava witten kind of situation which would be singular geometry. So you can have similar things to the orientifolds in the M theory as well. So this no-go theorem applies only to the you know, M theory, the non-singular one. So they don't claim that they have ruled out the sitter in M theory, for sure, or string theory. Their, their view was that, well, it just means that this is not where you should look for. But it's surprising. It is surprising that for an arbitrary seven manifold, no matter how hard you try, and which dictionary of seven manifolds you look up, it's not going to help you. 
It's just strange. Now, um, you could say, well, can I come close to making it uh, vanish like this? Not exactly zero, but very close to zero. Could you make it smaller and smaller and smaller? It turns out there's an easy argument that not only you cannot make it critical, you cannot even come close to making it critical in the following sense. You can show that the, the slope of the potential as a function of the field is always bigger than uh, some constant times v, where z is some positive constant. So there is a bound. Not only if v is positive, you can show gradient of v not only cannot get to 0, it cannot even come close to, to 0. It's bounded away from 0 by some amount. So the slope of the potential is, is bounded from 0. And you can, this you can, uh, you can strengthen the model you know, known as no-go theorem to get such a bound. And the argument is actually amazingly trivial. The argument is you just rescale the internal manifold. As a function of that direction, the gradient is never 0 and it's proportional to this. That's it. The argument is that trivial. So, so using just the boring rescaling argument, you can show you can never get rid of that mode in terms of stabilizing it. You don't get any, any bound on C from that, do you? Well, we, for, the, for the M theory case, we do. For the smooth M theory. So for, the th for more precisely, I'm going to write it in a second. So if you go more generally uh, from 11 dimension to D dimension, not just 4, you find that C, uh, the, the C that could appear in that formula is 6 over square root of D minus 2 times 11 minus D. So for example, for D equals to 4, you get C is 1.6. M Planck is 1 for me. M theory, M Planck is 1. Yeah, I'm doing M, M, M theory and Planck is 1. And uh, no, no. So you, when, sorry, when you go about, when you go, sorry, when you compactify, you of course go to the Einstein frame of the lower dimensional. Okay, so the lower dimensional yes, dimensional. yes. Now, uh, is this realized? Is this? Could it be? Could you do any better than this? Well, it turns out that, for example, in four dimension, you cannot do better than this. Sorry, in other words, you can saturate this bound. It's the best you can do for this no go theorem for the smooth supergravity because. If you take ADS 4 times a 7, sorry, AD, yeah, this geometry, as a function of the radius, you will have a geometry like this. So there's the, this is the usual, as a function of the radius, you have the usual minimum, which is the usual supersymmetric one. But you can, be displaying, you can displace yourself away from the supersymmetric one, and you can compute the slope. And the slope, as you go closer and closer to the origin, approaches the gravity of, of order of B. So in other words, this bound is as good as you can get. And it's real. The limiting cases can be realized in supersymmetric context by shifting away from the vacuum. Any questions? Okay, so we learned that if there is this iter, it is a quantum, Planckian, non harmonic oscillator type of situation. We cannot rule it out, but it's, it's that. We have to at least agree that there's something exotic with this iter, and because these kind of simple ideas show that it cannot happen. So I said from the beginning that our universe is fine-tuned. Now, for the con context of, for example, hierarchy, there are ideas, for example, Ibanez, I'm sure, will tell us about how ideas related to something can be related to. I mean, uh, Carlo Fermin is also from this perspective, Flankian, uh, exotic object. Yeah, so the, the fact that we live in a very fine-tuned situation in our universe, there's no doubt. It looks, I mean. Well, having Carlo Fermi is not that exotic. It's an index theorem. So that's not, I don't know what you exactly mean by Carlo Fermi being exotic. Well, you mean from M theory perspective. Yes, OK. Uh, that's fair. So M theory, you don't get even gauge group that way. So you say we have, we for sure have SU, you know, forget about parafermion. You have SU2, AU1. So SU2 at least, you don't get that way. You need singularities. Yes, so that's why this is not a proof. And we know in string theory there are other ways that we get it. So that's well taken. So there's, there's I didn't claim this is a proof. But you, but you would have imagined that there may be one. If the sitter is not an, why shouldn't have been one example like this, which is not exactly like our universe? That's, that's a, the main thing I'm trying to say. This is, is like kind of the intuition that we have in physics. If something is difficult to get, there may be good reason. That's the, 
That's the main point I'm trying to give with this explanation. It doesn't prove it. You're right. Can you say more about the parametric dependence of C in limits where it starts to approach singularities? Or sorry, when, when R and G start to become uh, not so small? Uh, well, we don't, we don't know how to do that because part of it is that the higher, high, higher order corrections, people have not taken into account these arguments. So I cannot, I cannot argue anything about when, when, the, when the higher order comes in. This is based on just simple Einstein theory plus, plus G squared. You might have R to the fourth, R to the eighth. And if those are becoming big, order one, they might compete and the signs might be important, all that stuff. So, well, no, just at the leading order, like a small perturbation. I, 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 I certainly I don't think anybody has studied it as far as I know. So here, basically, we, people have talked about the, the large radius limit and so forth. I think the bound is just simply not there. If you go beyond the... Well, no, I mean, we're still, we're, I mean, I still want to be in the limit where things are kind of like smooth, but I want to take into account, like he's saying, like R to the fourth corrections, things like the first order. OK, so, you, so just like the first order corrections is the one direction where things go. Yeah, the question is how much, how much of, uh, I mean, the first order correction is good if that term is small. So, and if that's small, you can ignore it. So the question is, how much are you willing to trade off that term with, and what does it mean to take the first order correction and not all of them? So that's the kind of difficult question. Um, then there are other examples. So suppose you start with a theory in D dimension. So let me just erase this. So we just start with the theory in D dimension and go down to D dimension by some compactification. D could be 10, like in type 2 strings or, or, or some other one, and M theory 11 and so on. If your background, if your compactification uh, that you use respects the strong energy condition, which is not a property of string theory for sure, the strong energy condition is violated in string theory, but if, if you look at backgrounds which respect the strong energy condition, you find the grad V is bigger than or equal to an expression like this. And if you look at backgrounds which respect the null energy condition, again, this is not a property of string theory. You find, not a general property of string theory, but you can rest restrict your attention to backgrounds which respect this. Then you find that the grad V over E is bigger than, uh, there's a factor of two here maybe, I mean, Got this wrong. Something, anyhow, some formula which the detail doesn't really matter. But there's a bound of order one uh, in this form. Okay, so these are interesting situations. So you get these kind of bounds. So already you know, for example, if you believe in the sitter or whatever, that our universe cannot be satisfying the, the geometry, has to explicitly violate the null energy condition, because otherwise you get some contradiction. With, with, with this. Very good question. Nobody has done that. It would be interesting to see if one can use that to get a bound. So the bound that we, we got was based on the null energy condition. Our null energy condition um, is a more, has a better chance of being true in the context of string theory. But in quantum field theory, we know it's true. In a gravity context, we, I'm not sure if it's absolutely true or not, but, uh, but it's a better chance of being true than, than the null energy. So yeah, so it should be studied. So that's a, let me just raise it as a question mark. Then there are examples. There are examples which are not based on you know starting from uh, the dimensional reduction to try to break supersymmetry. There's already a string theory which does not have supersymmetry. For the majority of you who are rather young here, perhaps you don't even know about this example, there's a 10-dimensional string theory, uh, which is called the SO16 cross SO16 string. And it's in the context of heterotic string, and it's the non-supersymmetric and non-tachyonic and chiral and all that. So it's a nice 10-dimensional non-supersymmetric theory. And you can try to compute what is the cosmological constant of this theory in 10 dimensions, it doesn't have supersymmetry. You don't have to compact for anything, there's nothing. But there's, of course, there's one parameter, which is the dilaton. So you can take the weak coupling limit and try to compute it using the weak coupling techniques in heterotic string. And you find that uh, when you go to the Einstein frame again, you find that as a function of dilaton field, it, it goes like exponential e to the minus 5 over root 2 phi, where 
bigger phi means weaker coupling. So at, as the coupling gets weaker and weaker, you get some exponential potential like this, which again has the nice property that grad V, in this case, is bigger than, uh, well, in this case is equal, but let me just say in this case is equal to phi over root 2, at least for large phi. OK, these are examples. Now, interestingly enough, um, Hertzberg et al. and also uh, Rassi and Zuckerman. I'm not sure if Tim, are you not going to talk about this, are you? A little bit. Okay. So Tim will talk about, about his work as well. But what they showed is that, uh, so they started studying basically the rescaling argument of a combination of the dilaton as, well as, the, uh, as well as the volume. So there are two parameters they studied. They studied in the context of uh, scalar curvature being zero, uh, kind of like Calabia kind of situation. These guys did it a bit more generally. And you can, you can use the arguments that these guys used and extend it to even further to, to, to basically rule out the following situation, essentially. That if you take any type 2 compactification, if you include any Ramon-Ramon flux, well, there are a few exceptions, but basically any Ramon-Ramon flux, and a fixed, uh, for a fixed Q, any oriented fold of that dimension and the D brain of that dimension. So these are now ingredients that violate the things that we know, for example, neural energy condition could be violated by negative oriented fold planes. But still include them with a fixed Q, not more than one. So to fix a Q, you took that, and then, but arbitrary F, with a few exceptions, you can show that grad V is bigger than or equal to CV for some, for some C that you can compute, for depending on the case. OK, again, easy rescaling argument. Not, not, nothing amazingly difficult to argue. Now, the attempt there in these contexts was not to try to say this is a principle of any kind. It's just they try to use these kind of arguments to say where you should not be looking for this etc. Okay? They say, okay, this you cannot look there. It's not bad. This is bad. This is bad. But, but luckily, not all of them can be ruled out. So therefore, that was a good sign for, for having this etc. You say, okay, good. So we now can narrow our search. That was the main emphasis in these papers, to try to narrow the search for this etc. <coughs> OK. Um, now, you, you could also say, look, given that this iter is hard to get, and given all these no-go theorems, and since there's really no real proof that we have actually constructed this iter, at least many people believe that's an issue, we might as well contemplate, contemplate the opposite possibility. What if there is no this iter? Suppose this iter belongs to the swampland. What if this is true? Let's just ask the question. Well, I think we ha the fact that we live in this sitter has been so much ingrained in our thoughts that once you, once you even raise this question, the first reaction is, do you mean string theory is wrong? Right? Because, you know, the sitter, we live in the sitter. What do you mean the sitter belongs to some plan? It means the whole, the whole thing is nonsense. No, no. So the statement is that the fact that it's ingrained in our head that we live in the sitter is, 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 is the thing I want to discuss a little more. How do we know we live in the sitter? Well, we have measured dark energy. Well, do we know the dark energy is fixed? Well, uh, is it constant in time? Well, there are strong bounds, for example, and I will try to mention these bounds. If you try to find, if you say, well, we are not, the dark energy is the sum, level of some field and it's not fixed, it, it would roll. And in fact, you can bound the potential, the slope of that potential based on observation. In the past epoch, you can see how much whether the dark energy is changing, and put a bound on it, and you find the gradient of the potential in fundamental units is less than 10 to the minus 122 also. In other words, not only V is small, 
Its slope is also small. It sounds like double fine tuning. Okay? So this was one of the first reasons that people said, look, come on. You have, you have energy and also things varying so slowly, this sounds bizarre. Double fine tuning. One fine tuning is fine, double fine tuning is not fine. Now, but what, is, what is the gradient of the ratio to V itself? I will come to that. Okay. <laughs> I will come to that bound. I'm, I'm setting it up. I'm setting it up. <laughs> Very carefully. I'm setting up to, to, to for an anticipation exactly of that question, but thanks for asking. We'll come to that. So, um, so this, is, this is the bound on the slope we have. Um, it should be very small. And you know, people say, why not? If the center exists, why not? You know, of course, grad V equal to zero is also fine-tuned, but you could say, well, being zero means you, know, you have stabilized the potential, so it's not abnormal to be there. So as long as there's a good reason, there's some, something which is a boundary of some region, like zero, it's not a problem. Okay. But, uh, but the bound here, so therefore, suggests the, the center. That's one reason people like the sitter, that, this fact. Another reason, if this guy is rolling, this phi is rolling, it will couple to fields and will change things. For example, if it couples to the standard model and so on, you will get variations of delta of alpha, for example, or the masses of the quarks, or this and that. So you would imagine that this, you would imagine that this would show up as some variation, and there are strong bounds on these variations. In fact, there's one worse thing that could happen. If the slope is so small, this basically looks like a flat thing. It looks like a massless field. If I look like a massless field, and then you can have exchange of this massless field between quarks or, or whatever they couple to, and it gives you a new kind of force, the fifth force, and again, there are strong bounds on the fifth force. So what we learn is that if we are in a rolling situation, then that rolling field cannot couple appreciably to our sector, strongly bounded. Doesn't that sound familiar? Sounds like dark matter sector. So we know there is dark matter, which is weakly coupled to our sector at best. So you would naturally say, OK, this could belong to the dark sector. So that's not a good argument. So. So the argument, so the, the only thing that sounds like uh, there could be a, an issue is the fact that the slope is, seems to be, again, double fine-tuning here going on. Sorry, so you allow it to couple strongly to the dark sector? It has to, in some so sense. What happens to structure formation in that case? Well, the, dark, the question is how the very, people have actually tried to find the issue, the, the, uh, the analog of the force extended between dark matter sector based on exchange of phi and the variation of that, and the equivalence principle and all that, the bounds are very weak. So this, we don't have much, much bound on those. People have begun, astrophysicists have begun asking those questions. What do we know about the dark sector and these kind of violations, apparent violations of equivalence principle that this would suggest? There, there, there are some bounds, but not very, not very strong. OK. Um, but anyhow, the statement, I mean, the first reaction is, come on, how could this not couple to our field? is refuted by experimental observation that there is dark sector. So the fact that dark sector is experimentally verified, it better be that in string theory we, we have a setup where we get dark matter weakly coupled to us, well, then phi could be part of that sector, that's all. In other words, it could be that the dark energy and the dark matter are unified to one sector, that's it. Not that exotic. For example, it could be in that picture I was drawing, it could be that you know, this is the standard model piece, the dark sector could be, for example, over here somewhere, and that could be expanding, and that could be the field corresponding to expansion. Or maybe the whole volume of the Calabria, more naturally or something, is that field, and somehow the middle piece here is kind of frozen by whatever flux. The rest of the manifold is kind of growing. The boundaries are moving away, but there's some frozen kind of thing, which is our sector, maybe. Or maybe pieces that could potentially mix with us, and I will discuss that later. But at any rate, it doesn't have to change our sector. Can you explain how this uh, modifies the equivalence principle? Well, you see, the, you, would, you would imagine that if there's forces between them goes like m squared, you would say, oh, well, it doesn't go like m squared anymore. So that means there's another additional force look, will look like apparent violation of the equivalence principle. OK, um, good. So. Now. The only fine-tuning we haven't addressed is the slope. 
in this context. If you assume V is small, then why is double grad V small? So let's, let's say we are not worried about solving the cosmological constant problem, but what would give us the grad V being small at the same time? Two problems. Well, if grad V is somehow related to V, then this would not be that exotic. That is, if the boundary, if the smallest you can make the slope is related to V, you cannot make it any bigger, then this could be perfectly fine with observation. So it's not that fine-tuned. So the whole picture this suggests is that the De Sitter space is not the only way we can connect our present universe, our universe to the present situation. We can have a situation, we have a rolling scalar which couples weakly to our sector for which the slope is related to V. As we have seen in string theory, in many examples, this is not, not only exotic, it's very typical and this limiting case. So therefore, there is no reason, and that's the main, one of the main lessons I want to give in this talk here today. Models where we have a rolling scalar model of dark energy is supernatural in the context of string theory, and we should study them. It has been studied by a few papers, not as many as they should, and I think that's one thing I think we should study more seriously. Studying what is called the quintessence models of dark energy. Quintessence in this context is just a statement that we have a rolling scalar field with the potential rolling. That's a very natural possibility in string theory. This iter is perhaps we can ask whether it exists or not, but regardless, this is certainly much more natural than this iter to get. It's much easier to get, and it's much, there's no observational bound which violates it directly, so we could study it. So that's, I think, perhaps, that's perhaps my main lesson here is quintessence has not been studied as much as it should. Yes? When you say it's easy to get, you mean some two-level calculation, like some supergravity. You, you, some you will have a situation where gravity and V are related. Is in, for example, that volume depends. If, if, for example, that field I'm talking about is related to the volume, we will get such effects right. similar to this. But well, loop, the loop correction is not spoiled. Well, uh, we can talk about loop corrections. I'm just saying that for large manifold, it's certainly true. There could be corrections to that statement. That C could change and whatever. These are both very small, right? So then the corrections... No, no, the ratio I'm talking about. The ratio yeah. is some number of order one. That's my main point. The ratio, for, is the ratio protected against... It was. I was. In those examples I showed to you that for large volume, it is protected. So it, we, we derived it using the supergraph. You have to violate. You have to take the effective corrections into account to change it, which means if the effective corrections of order of one over M Planck the ratio of the curvature to the M Planck is small, then you expect the corrections to be small. You wouldn't expect to be infinitely big if that's small. So it's reasonable to say that that's, that's protected. What are the bounds on operator mixing between the visible sector and dark sector? Very good question. We don't know. Well, so, sorry, there, the visible sector and dark sector, there are bounds. Of course, people have written, but... The, no, no, but because you're going to allow the contestants to be coupled with the dark sector, so now I can run those things on the loop. Well, the question is, yeah, of course. So, so, so this, would, this would be very interesting because it suggests that dark sector... If it couples to us, then that field will also couple to us. Yeah. And I will talk about some potential aspects of, of that, in fact, later. So there's potentially interesting mixing with our sector. There, there could be. So I'm not saying it's zero interaction. So Yeah, yeah. yeah there could be. We'll talk about that, perhaps. OK. Um, good. So let me just then say, if this is the case, it's natural to say, well, maybe this is a criteria for, for a swamp land condition that, that the gradient of V it's always bigger than or equal to C times V for C positive quantity. So let's, say, well, let's contemplate such a possibility, criteria. Could there be such a criteria that grad V is always bigger than V with some proportionality constant C, which may depend on dimension? Well, um, well, you might have said, well, we are going too fast here. Why didn't we just say grad V is bigger than some constant? Let's just start with bigger than a constant, universal constant like this. Could that have been the case? No, this cannot be the case. What, why, why not? We have counterexamples in string theory. That's now just like kind of games we play in Swampland kind of thing. You take a possible Swampland criteria, you check it against string construction and see if you have a counterexample which is reliable, which you know you have constructed. Well, what is the counterexample I have in mind? Take Calabia threefolds. Supersymmetric, we know everything about it. Well, we know many things about it. And there are massive fields, we know of like BPS states in that theory. So there will be a potential of the form 1 half m squared phi squared, like thing. And if you take grad V, the grad V will go like, uh, like phi in this case. And you can make R pretty small as you approach zero. So there's no, there's no such thing. This cannot be possibly true. So this cannot be true. So if you replace this by some function of fields, the most natural simple thing would be something like this. 
Now, um, and we have seen examples, uh, no-go theorems and string theory, which fit exactly this pattern. So why not? Let's, let's try to ask that question. Could there be such bounds? And uh, indeed, uh, you could exactly look at this example again. V is 1 half n phi squared. And if you compute grad V over V for this case, you find this goes like 1 over phi. So as phi goes to 0, this becomes very big. So therefore, there's no problem with this bound being bigger. So it's satisfied with the inequality. Now you say, aha, uh -huh, what if we take phi bigger and bigger? Well, we don't trust this description of the potential at any rate for phi big. We know that in particular, phi, a range of fields phi bigger than 1, you get all these exotic states and interactions and so on. So this is only near phi equal to 0 at best. So near phi equal to 0, this does not give us a counterexample. So at least there's no counterexample. How about non-supersymmetric bonds? Well, non sorry, supersymmetric bonds. Supersymmetric bonds, you can have grad V equals 0, like ADS situation, but then V is negative, and this is trivially satisfied. So and how about supersymmetric bonds with zero cosmological constant? Again, V equals 0, and that's why equality sign is needed here. So grad V can be 0 when you have V equals 0. So at, like Calabia, you can have grad V equal to exactly 0. There's moduli. In some sense, this case is a deformation of the supersymmetric case. If you take any supersymmetric compactification to Minkowski space, you try to deform it to break supersymmetry, what do you do? You give web to fields. But any field web will look like, like this kind of near, near phi equal to zero, will look like a mass. And therefore, you can see that any supersymmetric theory, slight deformations of it, will not violate this bound either. So therefore, at least this passes the first few checks and so we could then contemplate the possibility for such a conjecture that grad V could be bigger than or equal to some constant times V for some positive quantity C. I think that's, oh, before I, I, I finish, so uh, before I take a break, I want to point one thing out here. Uh, here, you know, we got grad V over V as order 1 over phi, and we know that the range of phi could be as large as we want. So in the context of, for example, these distance conjectures for, this, for the swamp plant, we know that if you go farther and farther, it's not that you stop the distance. It's that you get lighter and lighter modes. So your effective field theory, which ignored those modes, breaks down. But not that it's a problem. So it's, it's a problem if you, if you claim that you don't want any, any light fields, any additional light fields, or if you trusted your effective field theory description. So one possible ver version of this conjecture will be to, to try to say it that way. That is, you get light states. So this is the tower, if you wish, the tower version of this conjecture. Instead of this, you could have said, no, no, there's no sharp bound like the one I'm saying, but rather you get a tower of light states of the form e to the minus v over v prime with some constant. So this is exactly modeled after this. If you take v over v grad v, this will be exactly modeled after e to the minus the distance. So as you can see, phi is v over grad phi. So you could kind of say you get the tower of light states if you try to go towards the center. Not that the center is impossible. You, you, will, you will get lighter and lighter states in the game. And there is something to say about this conjecture, because you could say Vasiliev theory, for which the sitter can be done in principle, would be of this type. That is, that, in that context, grad V is 0, and you get infinitely many masses, higher spin states. So it's possible that if you try to enlarge the story, you might have a situation like this. But let me, for the purposes of today's talk, I will, take, I will take, stick with this version, which means that even if, it is this, even if this is the true statement, that means this version means that if you, if you violate this, your effective field theory breaks down. So one way or the other, you would translate the question into something, something like this. OK, so I think we'll take a break till 11.30, and then uh, I'll talk about what implications these will have. Okay. So the second part, I, I want to describe, the, review the consequences of this constraint or this uh, potential constraint for swampland on cosmology. In fact, I want to talk about two possible ones. One is assuming there's a constraint like this. And then also taking into account that the field range is bounded. Now, again, as I said, what this statement means is that your effective field theory breaks down, not that the field distance uh, is bounded. So for a given cosmology, if you want to limit your uh, uh, light states, the tower of light states that you get, there's an effective length scale in field space, which I call delta. Again, I'm dealing with Planck, Planck units, so this delta would be order 1 in some sense. We don't know exactly what it is. Some people say it could be like 5 or 10. 
depending on what model you deal with. Okay, I don't know exactly what, what's the reasonable delta, but there is morally some delta. This one, I just want to take one, one, one uh, fact here is that um, uh, both these constraints disappear when you take m Planck to infinity. Namely, if you restore the m Planck into discussion, this will look like this. And if you in introduce m Planck here, this will look like this in 4D. I'm d d dealing with 4D. So as m Planck goes to infinity, there is no restriction on delta phi, and there is no restriction on grad phi, which as it should be. There is no restriction on field theory for sure. So this, at best, is a gravitational kind of situation. So it's, so it's always nice to check that, that issues that we think are uh, swampland kind of conditions disappear when you take m Planck to infinity, because we know that should, you shouldn't get any more condition than the usual effective field theory consistency conditions. OK. So these are the two things I want to talk about. Uh, so let's, again, divide our discussion to three parts. This is the, I'll start with the past. So past, again, the paradigm for, for uh, current description of the early universe is inflation. And I have already talked about this aspect, that delta phi uh, is less than delta. There's already some tension, because you find that delta has to be basically in these plateau models, bigger than five. And this is, again, people have claimed that there might be some models like this. But again, it's borderline at best. So at least there's some tension there, if not ruled out. Yes? Yeah, first, you get everything fine when you go in Planck to infinity. You get set, uh, no restrictions, blah, blah, blah. but it still doesn't tell you that you are not going to get any theory. There is a restriction on the theory you will get without gravity, right? And the goal is to find out what are restrictions on the theory without gravity. Well, that's not the, the, without gravity. There's no restriction uh, other than effective field theory consistency. So you can have any theory coupled to gravity. No, no. Without gravity, I'm saying. With gravity, there are restrictions. And we don't know what the restrictions exactly are. But this doesn't tell us what they're doing. No, I'm saying this is a constraint. Yeah. It's not the only constraint. We just have one of them is presumably this. Now, the inflation models, again, in the context of plateau models, you can ask whether there's any bound on this. You see, I mentioned to you that the, the natural scenario was kind of a semi-flat kind of a situation like this. And this runs kind of a tension with this situation where grad v wants to be not small. So the big v is you would give big grad v. So there would be some tension. And if you look at these plateau models, which are the most favored one, uh, like phi squared and chaotic inflation, all that kind of thing are already ruled out based on some observations of the b mode and the, and the spectral tilt. But the plateau models, like Strabinsky model and so on, are not. And those are the most favored one. If you, in that context, you study it, you find that the value of c has to be less than 0 0.02 for it to work. So this is, uh, means that you have to have relatively flat and long. So there are two issues that you could say, well, you have to solve both, long and relatively flat. Now, if C is 0 0.02, you remember the numbers I gave you were like 1 or more than 1 and so on, typically. It's not easy to get below 1. But you know it could be fine-tuned. I don't know. But so, so again, I, one cannot rule this out, of course, because I'm not giving a stri strict statement what C is. But the smaller the C you make, the more likely it is that you have to deal with lighter and lighter states. And one of the issues is when you talk about inflation, you don't want to get light states, because the, the energy of the inflaton field will be dissipating to the light modes if you, if you get them. So traversing too long with getting light fields is a big problem. So you, you have to kind of control that as well. So um, anyhow, so these are some of the issues. Now you could ask, OK, if I'm, if I'm saying inflation is in tension, again, I say it's not, it's, I'm not saying it's ruled out, but certainly it's in some kind of tension. You could say, what are the other alternatives in the context of string theory? I'll just give you one alternative. But this is, of course, uh, uh, difficult in the context of string theory, because we do not know how the high temperature phase of string theory would exactly look like. But uh, if you look at the standard, uh, FRW situation, uh, if you like the radius, like e to the lambda. And if you kind of look at the usual situation, what you have is that if you look at the effective, the energy profile in the universe as a function of the radius, or lambda, you find in the early universe, which is radiation dominated, basically it goes exponentially down like this. And the equations that give you, so if you have an adiabatic expansion, like the, like the universe is expanding with radiation in equilibrium, and if it's dying away like this, you get basically rolling of a potential 
like this. So you just get a rolling. So this is the usual FRW. It can be reformulated in this way as a rolling guy in a potential given by the energy where you are assuming the adiabatic kind of expansion. Now, uh, we know that this is a problem because if you go earlier, earlier, they will get expansions of pieces which are, not, which are not causally connected, but they were not causally connected, so that's a problem. And so this rolling of the speedy rolling is a problem. Now, the idea we had with Brandenburg a while back was that, and this is in the context of string gas cosmology, and now I will say it a little more generally, is that this lambda cannot be like this. Why? Well, because as lambda goes to minus infinity, we know there should be additional light states. It cannot be just this. So you get extra light states. For example, if, if you had R goes to 1 over R symmetry, like a space in a box, you get R to 1 over R symmetry. So in that context, the potential that you will get will have to be some symmetric potential. In other words, the energy as a function of R go from momentum modes to winding modes in that context. So if you have a total entropy in your system, the evolution will not look like this, will look like some plateau kind of things like this. And we studied these kind of models in the context of string gas cosmology. We, we, we found that if you get, in the context of string theory, if you get sufficiently close to hagedorn temperature, the energy in the universe as a function of the rays will look like such a plateau like this. And the, it looks very much like the p picture people draw for the inflation put, inflaton potential. But in this case, it's literally the statement that the, uh, the radius does not affect the energy profile for the hagedorn phase. And why is that? In the hagedorn phase, the, uh, the string uh, entropy gets pumped into the oscillating modes. It does not depend on the radius of the universe. So in other words, the fact that it's almost independent of the radius is simply the statement that the energy gets pumped into these local degrees of, oscillating degrees of freedom, which don't probe the geometry of space. So this flatness becomes very automatic in that context. Now, in this context, you would have a situation where this guy gets rolled, and then it goes down to the radiation phase. Now it's much slower. And it, is, it has time to equilibrate. So unlike the situation with inflation that you have to inflate and then make them equilibrium, since you are having a long, slow evolution, you already equilibrate in the hagedorn phase. So that solves that problem. And the fluctuation that in the context of inflation is quantum, in this case gets related to temporal, uh, uh, the temperature fluctuations. And to get the similar features, like the, that, like the red tilt and all that for the power spectrum from thermal fluctuations in this, in this case. The second picture is uh, potential as a function of lambda? Yes. Pot potential meaning, in this case, you fix the total entropy and look at the energy as a function of lambda. And so so you're, assuming, you're assuming an adiabatic evolution. And as a function of the lambda, you find what is the total energy content with a given entropy. But that assumes canonical uh, kinetic term. So it is, uh, it is written. This is d lambda squared. That's right. D lambda yeah, that's good. That's right, because the radius, as we know, goes like the, the, the r over r squared. No, this is, the, you, this is dr, so usual kinetic term would look like dr over r squared. Yeah, yeah, which is like this. OK, uh, good. Now, uh, do I believe the detail of this model? No, I don't. But what, do I, what, what, what part of this I might believe? What the part of this that I do believe is that when you go to small lambda, the light string state, one way or the other, going to hit us. So FRW cosmology is a no-go from the get-go in string theory. We know that in early universe, you cannot say, OK, I just have this mass of stuff. It doesn't matter. We know there are these extended objects. One of the features, and I mentioned this last week, one of the features of any consistent quantum theory of gravity is extended object. Whether it's string, like in Hagedorn phase, or brains, that is part of string theory. So these light modes have to come into play, have to come into play when you go to such a small distances. If you imagine your space is, for example, a box of tiny size, they will have to play a role. This has not been studied as much. We studied Hagedorn phase, but admittedly, we had very limited tool for that. So we considered basically ignoring all the corrections and so on. We turned off the string coupling and so on. So that's, of course, not defensible because we didn't any better to do. But the idea that something could, could uh, temper this behavior is, in some sense, forced on us, because we get new light states and dual pictures that will emerge. So, so this could be the potential kind of idea, string gas cosmology or brain gas cosmology or some such idea. In string theory, could be what would replace inflation. This kind of direction has not been explored enough in the context of string theory. Yes? I mean, these effects are important only at the string scale, right? Which, which effects? What do you mean? What you're talking about. So here I'm talking about, so here I'm talking about the, 
G string going to zero in some sense, because I could not otherwise compute things. In this case, M Planck will be much bigger than M string. And so I'm talking about the string equilibrium of string modes. Yes? So in terms of usual inflation scenario, where, how early, I mean, does this completely replace it, or is it No, no, completely. No, 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 no. If this is true, you could get everything you want this way. So in other words, the issue of homogeneity and fluctuation could easily arise in this model, and we discussed it already. Is that natural in terms of the time Ye scale? Yes, yes. Well, there's one, th one aspect which is not natural in this case or in that case. The question is, how close are you to the Hagedorn temperature? That's the question of entropy of the universe. Mm -hmm. that, that the analog of the 60E folding, which is put in by the long plateau in the inflation context, which is how long that is, this plateau gets smaller and smaller the smaller the, the, the entropy you put in. So, so you'd ask, OK, why did I choose the adiabatic uh, diagram in such a way that you're close to this? Well, OK, that I have to put in by hand, yes. So there is some input I'm putting. The input means the entropy of the universe is not small. I didn't put, that's a huge number. That, that is put in by hand, just like the length of the inflaton potential is put in by hand. But they're both equally fine-tuned in that case. In other words, you cannot say this is bad, but that's OK. Either one, there's some aspect that you're doing that you have to fit in our universe. So, but however, this is more related to what we see in string theory. That is, the light mode should be, the winding mode should come into play. It is hard for me to believe that you get the temperatures close to Planck, and brain and so on do not play any role. That's completely bizarre. So this, this aspect, which was ignored at the beginning, because the people were not doing string theory, could easily be replaced with inflation and so on. But now, we have all these other ingredients. ingredients. I believe we have not been creative enough as a community to explore these directions. That's, my, that's what I'm trying to remind. R goes to one, so you actually should not trust anything except lambda goes to infinity region, right? No, lambda go, I'm just thinking about if you take a weak perturbation theory, right. you do trust it, it's just T duality, R goes to one over R. This is all I'm saying. It, namely, the momentum modes get related to winding modes. You trust it. You just go to a dual description. But now your winding mode winding, winding modes become like the new gravitons. Yeah, you cannot talk about this unless you include You cannot talk about, exactly, you cannot, we do it, that's, that's how we get this. Yeah. So we get the lambda goes to minus lambda symmetry precisely by including the winding modes. That's how we get it. That's crucial. So that's string ingredients. So string ingredients are crucial here. Now, anyhow, this was, in other words, I don't want to destroy inflation and say, well, OK, there's not no alternative. There, are, there might be alternatives, admittedly not as much studied. So I think it would be very interesting to try to develop this further. If you're talking about winding modes, you're making some assumptions of topology. I was, so in these models that we studied with Robert and with uh, collaborators, this space was a box, this, this three-dimensional space. And we were just thinking about the toroidal geometry expanding. So the flatness problem in that case was just given by hand, we just the torus. So that was not there. But homogeneity and so on emerged just by slow roll of this field. So, so I actually, sorry, I was always confused when I heard the talk by the people in cosmology that they would start talking only after electronic phase or something like that with metric sensor. What you're saying is completely crap because you have... I didn't say anything is crap. It's just I don't, don't put it into my... What you're saying is that you cannot start talking about these things from electronic phase. I, I didn't say that. I just, I didn't, I'm not criticizing their approach. I'm just saying in this context, it's natural to have this. What I'm saying is that the, in principle, you are advocating that you have to start thinking... You could think also about things which could make sense in the Planckian regime or near the Planck regime, by in including stringy ingredients. That's all I'm, I'm, I'm bringing into the so question. Mark. That model like trapping in uh, near and hand simply point, is that, that more or less what you are trapping? I haven't trapped anything in some sense, but you could say that R goes to one of our symmetry means the potential at this point is zero, critical point. So in some sense, you have to, at one point, lambda goes to minus lambda symmetry, means that at that point you have a flat one in that sense. So it's a self -dual yes, yes. OK. This is, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I have many more, more things to say. So this is the past, uh, present. So present, as, you, as we know, the attempt in the string theory has been in terms of dark energy uh, uh, with the De Sitter kind of situation. But if you look at the equation of state for the dark matter, uh, there's this uh, quantity W. So in the cosmological constant setup, uh, W uh, should be minus 1. So. Uh, of course, if you have a scalar field, the potential, the, the W will not be 1, and it will roll, depending on, uh, so you have some potential like this. The ratio of pressure to the density is something like this. And W, if, if phi dot is 0, 
would be minus 1. So it could be minus 1, but it doesn't have to be. It could be close to minus 1, depending on what is the kinetic term, how much phi is rolling. So you could ask, what are the bounds for w? So if you look at it, for example, in the, as a function of the redshift, z, where z equal to 0 is where we are. And let me go all the way to z is 1. So, so the observations gives you bound. So the observation is perfectly consistent with w being minus 1 throughout. Okay, so, that's, so the w is minus 1, if I want to call this minus 1. So w being minus 1 is consistent with all the observation. But, it's, but there's, a, there's a range of possibilities. And in particular, you get some kind of a plateau like this, where this point is something like minus 0.8 or something like that. So, so, so the w uh, bound as a function of z with, uh, with the supernovae uh, up to 2 sigma looks like such a bound. So, which means that assuming that w is always bigger than or equal to minus 1, you're in this regime. OK, good. So this does not show. Uh, I mean, I went to more than one. The one was here. So this, this does not show that we had, I would have to be minus 1. There's, there's, there's a room for this. And you can just ask, in the context of the potential satisfying this constraint, which one, if any, which value of c, is there any value of c, or what value of c would be consistent with this? Of course, c is 0 would be consistent with this constant. But what is the order of magnitude of c that would be consistent with observation? And you find that if you do different values of c, you get pictures like, pictures like this. So you have this potential like this. But let me just do different color, I guess, here. So you find that, for example, you get a picture like this for w. Uh, for c is of order 0.6. So c is of order 1, namely 0.6, is perfectly consistent up to now with observations. OK. In fact, based on the observations, and if you assume that kind of relation, potential satisfying that, w plus 1 would be bigger than 0.15 c squared, based on observations. So depending on what value you get, w today can deviate from minus 1 by 0.15 times c squared. So depending on what you think that c over there, what order one number you think is reasonable, that would be, uh, that would be there. Something like this. So anyhow, so this is the kind of bound you get. Again, it could be, let me just again point out, just to make clear, suppose that conjecture is false. It's possible that's false. We do know that the large variety of string theory constructions are naturally have gravity proportional to v, which means that regardless of whether there's this or not, this should be a natural thing to study, because we get order one type numbers, c's like 0.6, could easily fit the current data. So, so this idea that the, dark, the, the quintessence model could be natural is is what I really want to emphasize, regardless of whether we believe the conjecture or not. This certainly should be pursued, regardless of anything. In fact, let me say something uh, amusing. Suppose we compute the change of log v. Well, OK. Suppose, it's like, suppose we have a potential v like this. So if you have a potential, then the, the fact that 10 to the minus 122 is what the value we have is a different way, version of the cosmological constant problem. So the cosmological constant is not which vacuum we ended up with. But more precisely, where, do we, where are we now? Because this would be rolling. And typical potentials satisfying the boundary of this are exponential. So the natural flow, very, very large exponential growth for the phi. In fact, if you compute d log v from the current universe uh, over the course of it, so from the uh, past, infinitely in the past till now, how does log v change? Well, the log v originally, let's say, is order 1 in the Planck unit. So it's order 1 to begin with log v is 0. So the change in the log v is change in the 10 to the minus 122. It's basically the log of this guy. So the total integral of this throughout the course of the history as a function of phi, so in other words, if you take d log v d phi as the phi rolls, should be about 280 or so if you take this number. What this means is the following. If you, take, if you parameterize your potential, so you have e to the minus phi times some constant. But more generally, you can write this in the form like this. This is, with no loss of generality, I can write it like this if v is positive, taking into account that phi has a dimension of mass. So you can always write this in terms of d phi over m, which depends on phi, with some mass scale. 
So the potential could look like this. And what is d log v? Well, d log v is going to be the integral of d phi. If you take the absolute value, you get the integral of this over m sub phi. This should be of the order of 280 for it to be a natural solution to the hierarchy, to the cosmological constant problem, which means if the average of 1 over m phi, so you can write this as, as mass scale associated to phi, the average of it times delta, delta phi should be about 280. In other words, more precisely, if I in introduce the, uh, the uh, so I can rewrite this uh, in the following way. So you can write this as uh, the, the expectation that 1 over m phi the average of m phi, let me just take the ratio of it to m Planck, should be of the order of 280 divided by delta phi times m Planck. So this quantity is, is roughly bound, this is related to delta that I was talking about, it's bounded, the delta phi is bounded by delta. So this is something less, less than one, or order one, or perhaps less, the delta phi in the denominator. But this gives you that the scale of m phi is something related to m Planck over 280 times something of order 1, roughly, which is delta, which is m, uh, let's see whether I get my units right, m phi is this, times delta phi over m Planck. This is the average value of this m phi. In other words, the scale you associate to this field phi is, roughly speaking, 200, or about some factor of hundreds, less than m Planck, times some number order 1. And this is interesting because, um, because this is very close to the God scale. In other words, if you believe that you have a compactification scale that typically sets the geometry more or less similar sizes, the God scale is roughly related to the volume of these internal geometries. The scale associated with the phi, if that's almost related to the God scale, you will get a natural explanation of the cosmological constant problem. In other words, in this language, the current cosmological constant will be related to something like, like this relation, m phi, where, but if m phi is basically m got, you would be basically saying that lambda is the order e to the minus some constant times m Planck over m got. So the point I'm trying to, this kind of relation is not typically used to describe the hierarchy problem, but if m got is a factor of 100 or 200, whatever, smaller than m Planck, which is currently the kind of right range, this will give you some natural small scale, not as fine-tuned as people imagine. Okay, of course, I do not know these numbers to tell you, to, to make a precise prediction for m got, and I don't know exactly why m got should be m phi, but it gives you an idea that the cosmological constant problem gets a completely different reformulation, and these kind of relations can potentially be related to solving it. Yes? Yeah, so when I look at this problem, it looks like that when what goes to infinity? Pi is infinity. Pi. What goes to infinity? It doesn't go to infinity. Well, then pi over mass, mass is order of one, you said. It's less than it's less than order one. Yes, less than one. We don't know how much pi has moved since the beginning, but it should be less than delta. This formula, we cannot take it. Of course not. I'm doing. I'm talking about cosmology, after all. Uh, no, I don't understand. Pi has a meaning in the field. I understand that, but pi has a meaning. No, I, I, in this context, I'm strictly talking about cosmology. So, so M Planck is, is, has, a, has a finite value. So how about the future? Well, if you take the potential like this, so we, we, would, be, we would be rolling down here. And the question is, what's next? Well, you could, in principle, have some... Uh, go negative or continue this and so on, we don't know. But two things could happen. Either you go negative, in which case you go from an expansion to crunch, or if you go on for a while, if this range is bigger than delta, we get a tower of light states. So either way, depending on whether it goes this way or that way, you have a finite time before there will be phase transition in the universe. So you can estimate how long that takes, and you find that the, 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 the number of e-foldings, the number of Hubble times that it takes, 
is, uh, is of the order of, uh, less than, of the order of 2 delta over C. So in a time, in the Hubble time scale, 10 billion years time scales, in a time scale of roughly of order 2 times delta over C, where delta and C are the parameters that went to the conjectures, you will have to undergo a phase transition. This will make the coincidence problem, at least as far as its relation to dark energy, explainable. That is, we are a typical lifetime, a typical time in that universe, with a, with a, with, with, before we go to the new universe with a phase transition of some sort, will be of the order of 10 billion years, up to the factors of delta over C, which are over the one. So this would be a different explanation of the coincidence problem, a solution, potential solution to the coincidence problem, namely, we are about to undergo a transition in a few... <laughs> <laughs> well, 10 billion years is not so bad. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's more scary to be lonely for a long, long time. <laughs> <So> <laughs> maybe the new universes are more interesting. Who knows? So, <laughs> so, so this would be quite exciting. So you see, the main thing I'm trying to say is that simple ideas are actually very predictive, potentially, for our universe. Now, whether these conjectures are true or not, I don't know. I mean, they are motivated by examples, and in fact... So after we gave these uh, talks uh, and papers came out, there were people pointed out various things to us. So I didn't tell you. So this is it's hard to believe. This is only one month ago, but uh, we have quite a bit of uh, interesting uh, follow-ups from different people. So let me explain what has come up since. So immediately after our paper, there was a uh, 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 there was a group of people, Joseph and company, pointed out to us that there are models, potential models of the sitter already constructed in a reliable way, not the KKLT ones, but different ones, these flux ones. But the problem with them was that, uh, that uh, it was like this. So you were at the top of the hill. So now, on the other hand, uh, I guess we will hear from Tim uh, tomorrow, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, so whether or not how reliable this may or may not be. So this is still questionable whether or not this is reliable. If, if, if this was the case, if you have reliable examples of the sitter kind of geometries, even though it's unstable, if you have this, then of course this conjecture will be false because grad V will be zero here at this point. So that's, that would be a, a potential problem. Now, how do you solve this problem? You could say, if, if indeed these are reliable examples, you could say that the constraint I'm talking about only applies to v, d, v double prime positive, namely the Hessian should be positive. Namely, we're talking about stabilizing modes as much as possible. That's what our intuition is. Namely, the main intuition for the difficulty of the sitter is not that you want to get some unstable sitter. You're interested in getting something which is stable, and it is always this silly extra mode which is hard to stabilize. So in that context, you say, okay, we are only interested in regions of space, which is the Hessian is positive, so we're, we're just hoping for uh, stabilizing modes, and nevertheless, we can't do it. So in other words, one could in principle say that this is a prerequisite for this conjecture. So that would be a simplest possibility, if this is indeed a solution, that I would say that's the least uh, radical one, I would say. There have been other s proposals related to this by people, Andriot, uh, David Andriot, and also, so Andriot and also uh, Garg and Krishnan wrote a different kind of pictures motivated by the same question, by this kind of example. So people have cons considered different kind of versions of this conjecture based on this. Uh, Diwali uh, and Gomez had a different version of this conjecture, and in fact, the, the claim, the claim that this Diwali claimed that this is already in some form in their previous papers, where they claim that the fact that this doesn't arise, where they say that the c that I was in the conjecture I was mentioning was a constant, for them they say it could go all the way up to v, the value of the potential. So in other words, their, their bounds would be something like grad v squared is less than uh, grad v is less than v squared instead of. Sorry, be bigger than v squared instead of uh, bigger than a constant times v. Okay, I don't know what to say about that, but anyhow, that's a, another possibility people have raised. Now, more interesting, interestingly, in a paper by Tim and Arthur and uh, Frederick, the following was pointed out. Sorry? Denef. So Arthur and uh, Tim, of course, are going to be in the workshop. Tim is going to talk about some aspects, perhaps. But the issue was the following. So we say that there's, a, there's the Higgs sector, and there, there's a dark matter, there's a standard sector, and then there's this five field. How much do they couple together? Suppose we say there's absolutely no coupling between them. So the most natural potential that you would get would be V of H plus V of phi. 
So if this field phi does not couple at all to this H, then it turns out that if you look at the Higgs potential, we know that we expect it to look like this, where we are over here in the minimum of the Higgs potential. They find that in an infinitesimal region of the origin, this bound will be violated, grad V over V. So if they don't interact, and if it's like this, then you get a violation of the bound at grad V over V. So well, no, no. Of course, they know about that. So the, the gravitationally, they interact. But the question is that is there any other potential mixing between them? That's independent. Yeah, that's that's independent of gravity. So they say if it's like this, then you get run into trouble. Uh, and so they they also they point out that if you had potentials instead like this, if you have interaction like this, it won't be a trouble. So in other words, they point out that you, you have to kind of, if you have a complete separation, you will get into trouble like this, unless you, you do this uh, kind of interaction between them. Now, there are two possible, uh, there are a few possible ways out. First of all, this could happen. This is very easy to arrange in string theory kind of setup. For example, if you have D9, anti-D9 brain, you have a tachyon and you have a dilaton interacting. So this kind of thing is not that exotic. So you can get this, but they, they also point out if you have this, then you might imagine that there will be a term like this with interaction of the also four quarks, psi bar psi interactions. So they would say, oh, if you have a term like this, then why not a mass term like this? And then if that's the case, then you get into trouble because the mass of these quarks will be varying over time and there are strong bounds on them. But the H squared also would multiply eta to minus five. Anyhow, so by rescaling H and so on, you might have issue or not. So depending on whether or not you allow this or not, you could have a problem or not. So the question would be whether you allow an interaction between the phi and the Higgs sector without having much interaction with the, core, with the rest of the standard model. This may not be unrelated to the question that Martin was asking. That is, the Higgs sector seems to be possibly violating this asymptotic free situation. So it's kind of mixes in some form, perhaps, with the dark sector. We don't know. In which case, this thing may not be that exotic. On the other hand, it would make a strong prediction of what is the structure of the potential. So that would be the positive side on it. On the other hand, if that modification of the conjecture is true, that you have to be this there, then this issue that only arises at the metastable point is just off the table, because that's the only point, only region where you get into trouble, and so therefore you just delete that discussion. So the V double prime being negative will, will not apply to the conjecture, it would only apply to the regions near near uh, the critical points like positive potential. So that would not have an issue with that either. There could be other potential resolutions. For example, nobody has studied H near zero. People have studied H near V. That's where we are now. We don't know exactly how this potential would look like. And so this, there could be modification of this story. Maybe the Higgs is composite. Maybe this and that. I don't know. So the question is, is on the table. But what this shows is that this conjecture actually could have interesting phenomenological mixtures with the Higgs sector, which actually makes it even more interesting. So, Conjecture that where uh, you had uh, or uh, got about global symmetries can kind of uh, does it allow this? Because this one is a gravity summary which has a global symmetry. What's the global symmetry here? What? I mean, those two v's don't have to be the same. But that, 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 These two v's? Oh, this is v prime. V Sorry. Prime. Sorry, I, I didn't. This uh, Mexican head potential has. Uh, the no, no, this is the Higgs. This, 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 this is just the usual Higgs potential. This SU2 gauge symmetry will tell you. That's the symmetry, gauge symmetry. Gauge symmetry is always allowed in string theory, and that's the usual story. I think uh, I have run over time, so I think I will stop here. Thank you. You had to be start with a split Higgs potential as an Higgs, and uh, what about quantum? So the, the usual, so the kind of, so in the string theory D9 brain, D9, D9 brain situation, you get quantum correction of the form of e to the minus 2 phi or whatever number. So this is like 1 over lambda, 1 over lambda squared effect and so on. So yes, you will get corrections, but it could. You start with the one above, just from gravity. Oh, this one. Uh, I mean, to the extent Yeah, presumably there will be corrections. I mean, they, they were just studying the situation of their complete split. So th there will be some split. The main point they make is that if it's, if, if it is to solve it, you will have, it looks appearing as a fine tuning from the effective field theory viewpoint. But that's the nature of the game with this formula. So, in fact, the very congestion gravity is bigger than V sounds like fine tuning. So, that's, so what, what appears as an effective field theory fine tuning goes with the territory. So, I don't have any answer to that question. It's going to look fine tuned. 
Yes. So I would say from three theory and of intuition, that entire Lagrangian will multiply it to minus five. It could be. That's, that, that would be the easiest kind of situation to imagine is like that. That is, whatever it is, it multiplies it. But, I mean, I don't have any no-go theorem that cannot be done otherwise. Yeah. If it's tachyon, right, then... Uh, you know, for example, no, 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 not everything. I mean, it will, pack, it will multiply the open string sector, for example. The closed string sector will have a different story and so on. There are different powers. Yeah, yeah. So you can, have, you can have different pieces. So this is one piece, the brain-anti-brain part of the... System. Well, phi is infinite the field in this case, in this language. H equals zero, you mean? Yeah, well. It would be interesting to know if there is any potential. Uh, well, the origin of the Higgs potential seems to be the key here. So that would be an interesting point from the phenological viewpoint as well. So we don't know much about that point, other than the theory says the Mexican hat, so we, we think we know roughly what it is, but we don't have a deep understanding. Anyhow, any other questions? Okay, thank you.